Well hello everyone, my name is Wiggle and welcome back to a new video and today we're going to be playing the new Pokemon games, Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. I was super excited for these games because Generation 4 is my second favorite generation of Pokemon, just coming in behind Generation 3. Sadly enough, the trainers teams and stuff are based on Pokemon Diamond and Pearl and not Platinum, which makes me a little bit sad, but I'm still going to be enjoying this game so much and it's probably going to give me a lot of nostalgia. Let me know in the comments down below which game you picked up, I myself picked up Pokemon Brilliant Diamond, and I wanted to play through the game with my favorite typing of all time, and that's the ground type. And since this game is way too easy if you play it casually, I also decided to make it a hardcore Nuzlocke. The hardcore Nuzlocke rules will be on screen right now for the people that aren't that familiar with Nuzlocke. And before we jump into the video, let's try to smash 6,523 likes. And also don't forget to subscribe because there will be a lot of Billion Diamond and Shining Pearl content on this channel from now on. And with that out of the way, let's just jump right into Pokemon Brilliant Diamond with only ground type Pokemon. We first meet up with the professor of this game, Professor Rowan, and look how good he looks in 3D. Definitely not simping for him. But we jump right in and name ourselves Zwiggo, and our rival is going to be named Tyson. Yes, we will indeed be fighting Mike Tyson throughout this entire game. We then jump right into the world of Pokemon and see some weird documentary on TV. But that's not why we're here. Look at this cute chibi form of Lucas. I'm not gonna lie here, I was not a big fan of the chibi models at first, but when I played through the game, I basically started to love them. We then mess around with the settings a little bit and put our battle style on set and also change our window to this nice blue one. We then go out into the world of Pokemon as our mother sends us off. As we then enter our rival's house, we get thudded, but in 3D. This was definitely the moment that I looked forward the most to. Also, Tyson's mom is kind of a mood. We set our first steps in the wild and meet up with Professor Rowan and Don, who, of course, like always, forget their briefcase. This time we're going to get to pick another starter, and we're going to go with Turtwig since his final evolution will be Torterra, a part ground type. Turtwig is probably my least favorite of the three starter Pokemon in this game, but let me know in the comments down below with your favorite of the starter Pokemon in Sinnoh is. After beating up the little Starly with some tackles, we then meet up with Professor Rowan and Dawn once again. We're thinking that they're going to take away our Pokemon, but they actually just leave us with them, which is kinda cool. Since people back in 2007 had no idea how to run without running shoes, we're still going to have to pick them up in this game too. Then have our first ever visit to Professor Rowan's lab, and we get to name our Turtwig, and I decided to name him Dwight, because I've been watching The Office too much lately. After then heading back to our moms and getting ourselves our beloved hat, we can finally jump right into the world of Pokemon without any more restrictions. We learn how to catch a Pokemon with Dawn because, yes, we did not know how to do that yet. We also go to the trainer school because I wanted to pick up the TM for hidden power, but apparently after beating the two Abra trainers, you get the TM for workup, which is also something I'm not going to complain about. We also get ourselves the Pokech, which isn't on screen all the time anymore, and you can just open it up whenever, which I think is really cool. We then try to reach Orberg City, but we get stopped by Tyson again. He actually has two Pokemon that would be super effective against my Turtwig, but since I could just set up a workup and then tackle both of them, we could easily take them out because they have no moves that are super effective against me yet. And I'm also pretty lucky that Turtwig's defense is so high, so we could take a lot of quick attacks and scratches. We then found a Geodude in the cave just before Orberg, and we named him Dwayne the Rock Johnson. We then arrive in the mine where we see chibi little Rourke just smashing some rocks because, you know, the gym is not paying him enough money. After this, he goes back to his gym, but before we follow him there, we have to capture an Onyx in the mine as well, our third team member. But sadly enough, after capturing this Onyx, my Turtwig went up to level 15, which means that we're not going to be able to use him in the first gym. You also might be wondering why I'm using Turtwig, well it's because he turns into a ground type so I'm going to be allowing myself to use him. The same would go for Shellos and Gastrodon, if I wanted a Gastrodon I would first have to use Shellos, and Shellos isn't a ground type yet, but I would be allowing myself to use it. After naming the Onyx Fred, we then went ahead and challenged Rourke. You might see that my Onyx isn't level 14 yet, well that's because grinding in this game takes quite a long time and I wanted to get this video out as fast as possible. So I went in a little bit under leveled, but I just knew that we could take him on with our two rocking ground types. And I'm not gonna lie, the gym intro of this game looks absolutely amazing. But Rourke here is going to lead off with his own Geodude. I'll be leading with Onyx, 
Luckily for us though, we have Rock Smash on our team, which is a move that is going to be super effective against all three of his team members. It also means that my level 10 Onyx is going to be able to take down his Geodude and Onyx with only a couple of them. We then go into his last Pokemon, Cranidos, and here is where I have my first death because I didn't really want to switch in Geodude and I knew that Onyx was probably going to die anyway since it's such a bad Pokemon. So Cranidos ultimately finished me off with a Leer and a Bulldoze. I didn't know this thing was going to have Bulldoze. This is pretty scary. We then swap in Geodude and keep rock smashing away at the Cranidos until it eventually faints and just like that we have already received our first Gym Batch. We then backtrack a little bit and have our first encounter with with this region's evil team, Team Galactic. And if you thought that their bull haircuts looked pretty bad in the originals, well, they're even worse now. They definitely remind me of Coconut Head from Net Survival's Guide. Anyway, their team is pretty weak and we have Dawn to help us out so this battle was no problem at all. After fending them off, it's time for us to go to the nicest place in this entire region, the Floroma Gardens. Here I save this man from Team Galactic and he gives me some honey which I can slatter in trees. But since there is only one ground type that you can get from these trees, the ground type Wormadam, we're not going to be doing that because Wormadam is really not that good and we don't have time for it either. We then go to the Valley Windworks where we see a little chibi Mars here. And I'm not gonna lie, how are we going to take Team Galactic seriously when they look like this? Well, it doesn't really matter because she only has two Pokemon. One of them being Zubat, which Geodude takes out with two rollouts, and the last one is her big fat cat, Perugly. And yes, it looks even uglier than in the originals. Luckily for us though, our Geodude was able to hit a couple more rock smashes before having to swap out back into Turtwig, because otherwise my rock was going to die. And Turtwig could then KO the Perugly with two more Razor Leaves. We then reunite the daughter with her smelly dad. And the next stop on our journey is going to be Eterna Forest. But before we get there, we evolve our Turtwig into a Grottle. Eterna Forest is now in our sight and as we enter it, we meet up with Cheryl. In a regular playthrough, this is the perfect spot to grind up or maybe even shiny hunt a couple of Pokemon. But right now, we're just going to have to run through it pretty quickly because we don't want to overlevel our Pokemon for the next gym battle. There's a lot of stuff we have to do before we can take on Gardenia in the next town. First we pick up the Explorer Kit because now we're getting to the best part of this game. The Underground. Well normally the Underground in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl is just a place to dig up some fossils and spheres. Well here you can actually encounter a lot of Pokemon in different kind of caves. And luckily for us, there are a couple of ground type Pokemon that we haven't caught yet and can only capture down here. The first Pokemon I encountered that we could get was Gastrodon, a water ground type, which is pretty damn good. After capturing it, we named it Shelly and added it to the team. Before we get even more Pokemon, I decided to go and do some digging first. We got ourselves a couple of nice little items like a Draco plate, which will be amazing for Garchomp, but we also got these new things called statues. You can place them in your base and once you place them down they will actually increase the odds of that Pokemon's type to be encountered in the new caves. So after getting a couple of ground type statues I went ahead and scoured every cave that I could. And so I managed to capture myself a Rhyhorn which I named Manny from the movie Ice Age. I know Manny is technically a mammoth and Rhyhorn is a rhinoceros but still he kind of reminded me of him. And the coolest kind of cave in my opinion that I've encountered personally is the Volcanic Cave. There's a lot of lava in it, and the weirdest thing, there's Scroopies in there, which I don't think will survive very long since they're part bug type. The last Pokemon we get in the underground is one of the reasons that I got Brilliant Diamond for, and that's Gligar because I absolutely love myself a Gliscor. What do you mean, you can't get Gliscor until the post game? Why? Game Freak, why did you not place the Razor Fang in the spot that it's normally in? I guess we'll just be rolling with Gligar throughout the entire playthrough then. I don't mind though, Gligar is still pretty cool and very useful as a ground flying type. We named our little flying boy Wendy and then digged our way back up to the surface level where we met up with Chibi Cynthia. She doesn't really look as menacing now, does she? 
but does it mean that our fight is going to be easier? I guess we're going to have to find out later. Another cool thing that I learned is that HMs are not in this game anymore. They're replaced with TMs, so that's also a very cool little feature. And the statue of Dialga and Palkia looks absolutely sublime. With all of that sidetracking out of the way, let's go and take on Gardenia. And I actually went in a little bit under level because I thought her highest level Pokemon was going to be level 21. That's why my Gligar is also only level 21. Doesn't really matter though because he leveled up to level 22 in the gym fight itself. After taking out Cherubi with just two Fury Cutters. She then brought in Turtwig and our Gligar just learned acrobatics from that level up so I think Gardenia is done for. Because Turtwig can't survive on acrobatics, our last Pokemon Rose Raid can hit me with a Grass Knot, it does only about half of my HP though, and we then counter back with that acrobatics to KO Rose Raid and get our second gym badge. Now we have to save the local businessman from Team Galactic. Don't ask me why they want a Clefairy and a Baneri, Jupiter just isn't as smart as you think she is. She also only has two Pokemon just like Mars, but this time the Perugly is replaced with Skunk Tank, so Geodude can just one-shot Zubat with Smack Down, and I can also hit one more Bulldoze on the Skunk Tank after getting hit with a Snarl, I then decide to swap in Rhyhorn, and Rhyhorn only needed two more Bulldozes to take down this big skunk. But we also got poisoned and snarled, so he also almost died. After defeating Jupiter, she decides to threaten me without Pokemon, so that threat was basically empty, but we do get ourselves a free bike. We then proceed onwards with our journey and meet up with Dawn, who is going to give us the Versus Seeker, an amazing item that we're going to be using for grinding. We then meet up with tiny little chibi Cyrus in Victory Road, and apparently this guy is only 27 years old, but if you look at him in-game, he looks 43. After listening to his speech that doesn't make sense at all, we finally make our way up to Heart Home City and we get attacked by a rabbit. After yeeting it back to his trainer and making a little pit stop, at the contest hall meeting up with mom and chatting a little bit. We then try to leave Heart Home City, but we get stopped by Mike Tyson. Tyson's team consists of a Starly at level 19 that should have been a Staravia already, but we're not gonna complain, it's just going to make it easier on us. We one-shot it with acrobatics from Gligar. And to be completely honest here, Buizel, Roselia, and Bonferno, all three could not take a single acrobatics, so we easily defeated our rival as this was probably the easiest fight in this entire game yet. He then finally lets us through, and before we go to the town of the daycare, we have to go to the Pokemon Tower of this game where we have to pick up the HM for strength. I know, pretty weird location to put an HM, but just for the people that don't know where strength is, it's right here, you get it from this old lady. We then proceed to go through the rainy route where we absolutely do nothing actually, and eventually reach the next town where we can beat up the next gym leader, Maylene, for our third gym badge. She has fighting type Pokemon and luckily for us we still have our Gligar alive. So one acrobatics can take care of Meditite, two acrobatics can take care of Machoke, and then the third Pokemon Lucario isn't weak to acrobatics. But we do have a ground type move in our arsenal too, Bulldoze, 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 and that Lucario goes down pretty easily. Of course, not without her spamming a couple of Hyper Potions though, otherwise this wouldn't be a worthy gym fight. So after receiving our third gym badge, we then go ahead and use the mystery gift feature to get ourselves the gift Manaphy Egg. Let me know in the comments down below if you've ever played Pokemon Ranger back in the day and got this egg yourself back in 2008. We then go to the Safari Zone of this game where we can capture one Pokemon for our team, a Quagsire, which I can name McFish. After then getting ourselves the Fishing Rod 2, I also pick up a Barboach, another Water Ground Types. That's three Water Ground Types already. But sadly enough for us, we can't even get the best Water Ground Type. Sometimes life just ain't fair. And our Barboach's name is going to be Woozy. But you won't see him too often in this uh, playthrough though, he was not the most useful of the water ground types. But we do decide to evolve him into Wishcash at level 30. Speaking of level 30, yes, Crasher Wake's highest Pokemon is also level 30, just like Mei Lee's. So that's pretty stupid, I don't know why they have the same level Pokemon when they are the 4th and the 5th gym leader. Why do I say 4th and 5th? Well, because normally Fantina is the 3rd gym leader. I don't really get why she's 5th in this game. They could have changed so much from Pokemon Platinum, yet they left all of the ridiculous stuff in these games. I don't know if I love it or hate it. Anyway, let's jump right into the battle with our nemesis here, Pokemon Trainer Crasher Wake. 
Probably also the biggest chibi character in this entire game. Look how buff he looks. Crash Awake here starts off with a Gyarados at level 27. So I'm going to be leading with Gastrodon because I have ancient power on this thing. The only Pokemon on my team that's probably able to take on this Gyarados. After hitting it with a couple of ancient powers and him spamming a bunch of potions and me spamming a lot of recover, we eventually take down the big sea schnick. He then goes into his Quagsire, but we have the perfect answer for him. We swap in Grottl. Razor Leaf being 4 times super effective should one shot this and that is also exactly what happens. His last Pokemon is his ace Floatzel, which has Ice Fang, which is pretty, pretty scary. But since our Grottl has such a high defense stat, we can still just one shot it with Razor Leaf and take an Ice Fang like an absolute champ. So we defeated the big water wrestling guy and he is going to give us our fourth gym badge. Now normally we would just have to go and talk to the Team Galactic guy, but we actually forgot to get Dawn's Pokedex back, so we do that first. We also get ourselves the HM4 Fly here, which is going to be very useful for getting around. We then also evolve our Grottle in Torterra, which means that we finally have a full ground type team. Grottle is no longer weighing us down with his non-ground type. Now we can finally go back, talk to the Team Galactic Grunt and take on Tyson again while we're following him. He now has a level 26 Starly. Yes, he still doesn't have a Staravia. Come on Game Freak, you could have fixed this at least. But our Gligar here is actually going to do the same thing that he did the last time we met up with Tyson. He's going to one-shot Starly with Acrobatics, one-shot Weasel, then one-shot Rosilia, and finally Oko the Monferno 2. Cynthia then gives us the, the secret potion so that we can wake up the Psyduck, which are... I don't know what they're doing to be honest, but they look like me. And next up is normally the worst route of the entire game, the Defog route, but we picked up Defog and since we don't have to learn HMs to our Pokemon, we easily got rid of all of the fog, which meant that we're not in danger of missing any moves. We then decorated our Pokeballs a little bit since we had some free time, and I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing because I barely even saw the effects when I was done with these Pokeballs. We then go to Old Lady Town where we meet up with a wall of paintings. After staring at them, I decided not to buy the painting. But we did decide to get ourselves the HM for Surf, which we are going to be learning to Gastrodon as a better water type stab move. Then it was time to go back underground to get ourselves another Pokemon, and this time we got an Ice Ground type in Swinup, and yes, we are going to be able to get Mamoswine. So after giving it the name Wom, we also grab a Hippopotas with a Quick Ball, and this is definitely going to be our last team member here because we've run out of ground types to capture. The name of this Hippopotas is going to be Gloria from Madagascar. Damn, I love that movie. And we then immediately decide to get ourselves a Mamoswine straight away, and also a Hippo Down. And with the Sandstream ability, he might be pretty useful for us later on in the game because some of our Pokémon might have Sandstream. After doing all of this, we can finally go ahead and go back to Heart Home City to take on Fantina. I mean, her team is full of ghost types, and she really doesn't have anything to touch me with, so this fight shouldn't be too hard. We're going to be starting with Gligar, which is going to have the super effective knockoff on her. So I set up a sword stance, we get hit with a strength sap, which means that we're only at plus one, but this is enough to one-shot the Drivlin the turn after. We do get hit with the aftermath, which does a little bit of our HP, but the next Pokemon, Gengar, is going to be pretty easy to take down with a knockoff. Oh wait, it isn't, because it has a berry, which weakens Dark-type moves. So the turn after, I swap in Mamoswine to take out the Gengar with an Ice Shard. Now her last Pokémon will be Miss Magius, and since I'm confused and hit myself in my confusion, I am going to be swapping out Mamoswine before he's dead. And I swap in Gastrodon instead, but this thing apparently has Magical Leaf, which I forgot, and yeah, Gastrodon gets hit pretty hard, so I have to get it out of there. Torterra comes in after. I then put a Leech Steed on the Miss Magus, I get hit with a couple more Magical Leaves and Dazzling Gleams, but after that I can hit two more Razor Leaves to take down the Big Hat. G this gives us the power of the 5th Gym Badge, which means that we can now cross the sea with Surf. And then also a pretty cool feature in this game, if you use an HM, a Bidoof, a Bibarel, or a Staraptor will come along and help you. And if you use Surf, you'll be surfing on a Bibarel. Definitely a nice little touch to make the game a little bit funnier to look at. We then eventually reach Canalave City where we meet up with Tyson on the bridge. Luckily for us, the bridge doesn't open though, so we can just have a battle on it. He now finally has his Staravia, so I'm going to be leading with my Mamoswine and just kill it with a single ice shard. 
for Heracross, I'm swapping in my 4 times super effective Gligar with Acrobatics to kill it. This Gligar can then also one-shot Weasel with Acrobatics. Yes, this is going to be the same just like the last two times. Roselia with Acrobatics and then the final Pokemon more Inferno also with Acrobatics. I know he probably should have evolved all of his team members by now, but hey, this was just an easy battle for us again. And as we all know, we have to take on the next gym leader, Byron next, the father of Rourke. And Rourke, as you may know, killed one of my Pokemon, so we're going to be taking revenge by taking on his father and killing all of his Pokemon. Since he has Steel types and we have Ground types, this should absolutely be no problem. He does start off with something that is immune to Ground, a Bronzor. So I set up a Swords Dance with my Gligar and then hit a knockoff, but I get confused by Confuse Ray. So I decide to set up another Swords Dance, I then hit myself in my Confusion, get hit with a Flash Cannon, I then snap out of my confusion and finally kill the Bronzor with another knockoff. Since we are now at a plus 4 in attack, I thought we can easily one-shot the rest of his team, right? So I go for a Bulldoze on a Steelix, it doesn't quite one-shot, he hits me with a Gyro Ball and I'm only left with 10 HP. Luckily, I predicted that he was going to use a full restore here, so I just hit two more Bulldozes and take down his Steelix. He then sends in his ace Pokemon Bastiodon, also known as the inferior of the two fossil Pokemon. So I decide to swap in my Gastrodon, which should be able to take this thing down without any problems, because it has only got not very effective moves on me and two more surfs later and we have washed up this entire gym. Six gym badges acquired, let's move on over to the library so that we can hear a big explosion and you know what that means, go and save the late guardians. Over here we had our first encounter with the team galactic commander Saturn and I'm not gonna lie he looks pretty goofy in battle, his face looks a bit weird to me. But we're not even going to go over this battle because it was way too easy, so let's move on over to Mars. Oh wait, she was the same amount of easy as Saturn. So let's just save Dawn and the Lake Guardians, which are apparently taken already, so we failed our mission. But we've only managed to take out two of the three lakes here, so we have to put on our winter pants and go through the snow because we're heading to Snow Point City, baby. I almost got stuck in the snow because you literally fall into it in this game, which looks pretty cool because you're so tiny and small and the snow is so big. Eventually, we do reach Snow Point City and after taking all of the snow out of our pants, we can then take on Candice. And Candice? Graveler one-shot her entire team? Probably not. She was probably the hardest fight until now. So let's see how we managed to defeat her. She leads off with a Snover, which is an Ice Grass type, and that thing can literally destroy my entire team if it wanted to. So I decided to lead off with my Graveler this time. I immediately switch out to the Hippo down because I want to get rid of the Hail that's on the field because of its Snow Warning. So my Sandstream is going to cancel that out and give me a little bit of an advantage. I then set up Stealth Rocks, which means that her team is going to take a lot of damage when they come in except for Medicham. I then swap in Gligar because I know that I can take even an Avalanche from this Snover, and as I come in, it definitely goes for Avalanche, does a lot of damage, but we then counter back with an Acrobatics to kill it. Now, she swaps in Medicham, and normally I could just go for Acrobatics and kill it, but I looked it up and this Medicham is actually faster than me. So I go into Gastrodon, which can take an Ice Prunch pretty well. I then proceed to take out the Medicham with two Surfs, as it goes for two more Brick Breaks, but my Citrus Berry actually managed to make me survive. She then goes into Sneasel, and I was not expecting an Ice-type move here, so I swapped into Torterra. But it went for Avalanche and got a critical hit, which only left me with 4 HP, so this was pretty close. I almost lost my starter. So I then quickly swapped back into Wom, who was able to hit a dig on the Sneasel to kill it in just one turn, and then her final Pokémon, Snow, came out, the thing that I was most afraid of. I knew I couldn't stay in with Mamoswine here because I would die, so I swapped into my Graveler, which had a Citrus Berry and Sturdy, so I could at least survive one attack of this thing. After doing so, I could normally outspeed it and just kill it with a Rock Blast. But I miss my Rock Blast. Which means that the Bomb of Snow gets to attack me and kill me with a single Giga Drain. Now there was only one Pokemon on my team that could one-shot this Obama Snow and outspeed it, that was Gligar, I went for the Acrobatics and finally killed the big abominable Snowman. As you can see, we had a lot of close calls in this fight and we also had a death, so yeah definitely the hardest battle in this game so far. Remember when I said that we weren't going to add any more team members to the team? Well, I was wrong. There was one more Pokemon that we could add, and it was the best one that we could get, Gibble. Oh yeah, we're getting Cynthia's mean mean killer machine on the team. 
Randy here is going to be super useful, but first he's going to have to become a guard shop. So, now, before we can continue to the final gym leader, we have to do some story stuff. Let's take on the Team Galactic hideout, shall we? With its revamped new music, this building sounds even better to walk through, but that's not why we're here. We're here to listen to Cyrus's speech. What do you mean they did not remaster Cyrus's speech? That's the entire reason why I bought this game. Okay, I guess we'll just have to take him on in a Pokemon battle then. But his team is basically just no team because his Pokemon are so weak. Because my Gligar is able to set up a sword stance on his Murkrow, then one-shot it with acrobatics. Then one-shot Sneasel with acrobatics. And his last Pokemon, Golbat, also gets one-shot by acrobatics. What's with this game and people not evolving their Pokemon? I will never understand. Let's just grab the Master Ball of him and then go and freak the late Guardians by beating up Saturn. And I once again do this with my MVP, Gligar. One-shotting Kadabra with acrobatics, two-shotting Bronzor with knockoff, and then finally once again one-shotting Toxicroak with another acrobatics. We then get to free the Lake Trio by pushing this big yellow button, and now we can head on over to Mount Coronet, where we have to run around and beat up a bunch of people with bowl haircuts. And as we reach the top, we see the Dialga cutscene, but in 3D, which makes it look even better than in the original. You can even properly see the red chains now, which is something I'm pretty sure you couldn't do in the original. And since we are indeed a 10 year old of this game, we are going to have to stop Dialga. But first, we have to take on the the two commanders in a double battle together with Tyson. This was pretty easy though because I first focused on the left side on Commander Jupiter's team and Gligar was able to take down Bronzor with knockoff, Skunk Tank with Earthquake and Acrobatics and then Golbat with Acrobatics too and Tyson has already sent out his Infernape who is taking out the Bronzor at the other side with Flame Wheel. He then also proceeds to take down Perugly with close combat and the final Pokemon on their side is going to be Golbat again. And with another Flame Wheel Acrobatics combo we can take down the big fat Vampire Bat. This allows us to proceed to the final battle before Dialga against Cyrus. But before we take him on in a Pokemon battle, we first have to see the three League Guardians stop Dialga's time shenanigans. And I'm actually a little bit disappointed about the animations on the three League Guardians. I was expecting just a little bit more. But hey, we stopped the world from devastation, so it's time to unite all people within our nation by defeating the one and only enemy, Cyrus. He now finally has a half-decent team, starting off with a Hunchcrow, one of my favorite Dark-type Pokémon. I decide to set up two Swords Dances with Gligar because he just goes for Defog two times in a row, and I then manage to just Oko it with Acrobatics. We then also manage to one-shot the Gyarados the same way. Crobat as well, no problem here whatsoever, and his final Pokémon is Weavile, so I decided to swap out because I thought it was going to have Ice Punch in its arsenal. As it turns out, it does not have an Ice-type move, so that switch was for nothing. So I decide to go into my Gastrodon, hit it with a couple of Ancient Powers, and that is Cyrus defeated already. He vanishes in thin air, because the Pokémon Police once again does not exist in this game, and we then decide to take on Dialga. We could also just kill him with a couple of Earthquakes from literally anything on the team, but I decided to just lob my Master Ball at it and add this baby to my Pokédex. The background of this battle though reminds me a little bit of Pokemon Mystery Dungeons Explorers of Time and Darkness because the Dialga kind of has that pattern in its color scheme. Now we save the world, one more thing left to do, get our final gym badge and then move over to the Pokemon League but first we evolve our Gabite into a Garchomp and we meet up with the cutest chibi character in this entire game, Chibi Flint. Look how fluffy his hair looks, it's like a red wooloo on top of his head. He asks us for a favor to go ahead and spark some joy back into Volkner's life, so we go to the lighthouse and tell him that we want to battle him. After doing so, we then head on over to his gym, which should be the easiest so far because electric types are weak to ground types. As it turns out though, he only has two electric types on his team, Raichu and Luxray. The other two are an Octillery and an Ambipom, which I don't understand why he has them, probably to cover some of his weaknesses. Our Torterra is going to be our leading Pokemon though, as we then one-shot his Raichu with Earthquake. His Octillery actually has Ice Beam, which is not going to be good if it hits my Torterra with it. So I bring in my Gastrodon, which can take the Ice Beam pretty well, and then counter back with some Earth Powers to take it down. 
He then swaps in his Ambipom, which means that I have to swap out into Mamoswine, who is going to go for a Dig and then an Ice Shard to take down the Two-Tailed Monkey, and his final Pokemon will be Luxray. I knew that this thing was going to go for an Iron Tail, so I swapped in Garchomp because I knew that he could outspeed next turn. As I do so, I go for the Dig and proceed to one-shot Luxray, getting ourselves our 8th Gym Badge and access to the Victory Road and Pokemon League. Normally, you have to have an HM Pokemon to get through the entirety of Victory Road. Luckily for us though, we don't need that in this game, so we didn't really have any problems getting through here. And so we get through the Victory Road unscathed and head on over to the Pokemon League to take on our rival first. He now finally has a Staraptor, no more Starly or Staravia. So I'm going to be leading with Womb here, and luckily because we have the Oblivious ability, our attack doesn't get lowered by the Intimidate. And we can actually hit the Staraptor with a super effective Ice Shard doing about half of his health as he U-turns out. Into his ace Pokemon Infernape, so I'm going to be going into Gligar expecting a close combat, which he goes for, so I take that pretty well, hit back with Acrobatics, and KO it from that range. The next Pokemon that he sends out is going to be his Floatzel, and I was expecting a Water-type move, but this thing apparently has Ice Fang, so I switch in my Torterra, but because of my affectionate bonus, we actually avoid the Ice Fang. And my Torterra just hits back with two more Razor Leaves to take it down, and we actually took some Ice Fangs pretty well too. He then goes back into his Staraptor, so I swap back into my Staraptor Killer, Mamoswine, and kill it with another Ice Shard. His next Pokemon, Snorlax, is able to put a yawn on my Mamoswine, which will eventually put me to sleep, but we can still come out on top with two more Earthquakes, as he then swaps in Rose Raid. For Rose Raid, I went into my Garchomp, because I knew that this thing couldn't really do that much damage to me. As I get hit with a Grass Knot, it doesn't even do half of my health. So we go for the Dragon Claw, it sets up the grassy terrain, and we kill it with another one. The last Pokemon is Heracross, so I decided to stay in once again and just hit it with two more Dragon Claws to win the battle against Barry. Now, before we take on the Elite Four and Champion, we have to do a lot of grinding, because the highest level cap for the Elite Four and Champion is level 66. So I grinded up my entire team to around level 63 to 65. And if you want to look through my team real quick, I didn't really have time to do that much EV training either. Here we have Garchomp, also Torterra, Gligar, Mamoswine, Hippo Down, and finally Gastrodon. And as you may see, some of my Pokemon don't have good natures. Well, that's because I only get one chance of capturing them, and if they have a bad nature, too bad. I gotta play with it. Now, I hope that these bad natures won't be our downfall against Cynthia, so let's jump right into the battle with a Aaron and see how we do. And of course, I'm only going to be using one Pokemon for this fight. It's our MVP, Gligar. Just imagine if we had a Gliscor. We could probably just solo this entire Elite Four with it. This is basically how the battle went. Acrobatics on Dust Talks. Set up a Sword Stance on Beautifly, then proceed to once again one-shot it with Acrobatics. Heracross was also just an Acrobatics to the face to kill it. Vespiquen goes down the same way, and the final Pokemon, Drapion, is not a bug type, so an Earthquake finishes off that big Scorpion. Now, let's move over to Bertha, and normally we just use Torterra for this fight, but I did some miscalculating with the EXP, and I'm pretty sure that if I use Torterra here in this battle, it will level up to level 67 by the end of Lucian. So then we can't use it to fight against Cynthia, which is not really what we want, so we'll be using Garchomp for this battle. I go ahead and set up a Sword Stance with Garchomp on her first Pokemon, Quagsire, and I then proceed to kill it with Dragon Claw. Wishcash also goes down by a single Dragon Claw. Sudowoodo 2, I probably should have gone for Earthquake, but I knew that Dragon Claw was going to be enough. So I just went for Dragon Claw. Now our next Pokemon is a little bit of a problem, Golem. I know it has the sturdy ability, so I have to swap out here because otherwise it might kill me with an Earthquake. So I just go into our MVP Gligar again and proceed to one-shot the big Rock Golem with Earthquake two times in a row. Our last Pokemon is going to be Hippo Down. Even though we have a Hippo Down of our own, we're not going to be using it against it. We're going to be swapping in Mamoswine and then proceed to kill it with two Ice Fangs. And that was Bertha out of the way, let's move on over to the cutest one of this Elite Four, Flint. Flint is going to be leading off with his Rapidash, which is actually faster than my Garchomp, so I decided to just set up a Sword Stance, and then I started Earthquaking. 
one-shotting Rapidash, Lopunny, Steelix as well, then taking out Drift Blim with Crunch, and his final Pokemon is going to be Infernape, which has a Focus Sash, so it survives my Earthquake. It seems I knew he was going to be using a full restore here because his Pokemon was in low health, I just proceed to kill it with another Earthquake since he doesn't have the Focus Sash anymore. Now we have one more Elite Four member to go, and that's Lucian, actually the hardest one in this entire Elite Four for me. He leads off with a Mr. Mime, so I'm once again going to be leading with my Garchomp. I set up a Sword Stance again because I knew this thing couldn't one-shot me, and for some reason he doesn't set up a Reflect, he sets up a Light Scream, so I'm good. I can just one-shot it with Earthquake. Medicham, also no problem. Another Earthquake. Alakazam is actually faster than me and sets up a Nasty Plot, so yeah, that's a turn wasted, he's dead again. Giraffe Rig goes down to a crunch, and then his last Pokemon is going to be a Bronzong. Pretty weird to not see a Gallade on his team. But after I killed that Giraffe Rig though, my Gligar and my Torterra leveled up to level 67, which means that we're only going to be able to use 4 Pokemon in the fight against Cynthia, which means that we actually might lose this challenge. I don't know why I leveled them up to level 65 and not 64, but that's totally on me. Luckily though, our Garchomp can still just one-shot the Bronzong with Crunch, which means that we can finally take on the champion Cynthia. Let's see if he's still going to be able to step all over me just like in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl and Platinum. Well, the starting cutscene looks so amazing in 3D. I do have to say, great job on that. Her entire room looks so cool. But she's still going to be leading off with her spirit tomb, and her entire team actually has perfect IVs and EVs. And my team doesn't. So yeah, let's see how this goes. We once again lead with Garchomp, set up two Sword Stances on the Spirit Tomb, and as it gets me down into Orange Health, my Berry activates, giving me a lot of HP back. This ensures that I can probably take a hit from anything, except for her Garchomp or Milotic. So I then go for an Earthquake, Oko the Spirit Tomb. Milotic is a Pokemon that I was really scared of, I really thought that it wasn't going to kill with one Earthquake, but apparently it did, so I got pretty lucky on that one. Lucario being weak to ground also gets Oko'd. Rose Raid goes down the same way as her last three Pokemon by an Earthquake. I'm not gonna lie, this battle is way too easy right now. And her second to last Pokemon is Gastrodon, which also gets KO'd by an Earthquake. Now it's Garchomp versus Garchomp as our final showdown. So let's see who has the best boy here. I try to go for the Dragon Claw because I know that that will one-shot it, but it manages to outspeed with its perfect IVs and EVs in speed, so we die. Our third death of the run. But luckily we have one Pokemon on the team that's actually our Garchomp killer, Mamoswine. I go for an Ice Fang, but she has an Ice-type move weakening Berry, so my Ice Fang only does about half, but we survive an Earthquake, hit back with an Ice Shard to turn after and kill her Garchomp, to become champion of the new Sinnoh region. As we walk up on over to the Hall of Fame room, we once again get greeted by Professor Rowan, and I do have to say that I kind of really like this game. But to be honest, it's not too different from Pokemon Diamond and Pearl itself, so I actually would have loved to see a couple more changes. But maybe Game Freak will bring out a later updates for this game to improve it a little bit, because it's just a little bit too outdated for me. So I would probably give it like a 7 out of 10 for a remake. Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire were definitely done way better, but let me know in the comments down below what your experience was with this game. And also, if you would like me to do the post-game of Pokemon Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl in a separate video because apparently there's quite a lot of rematch battles. But with that out of the way, I also want to thank my membership and Patreon supporters for supporting the channel. If you want to do so yourself, you can click the link down in the description. It is always appreciated but not needed. And as always people, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe and share this video with your friends. I'm Zwigo and I'll see you guys next time.